no big announcements. Um, next week and the following week, Pat and I, Patty and I won't be here, but you are going to be treated because the Reverend Lauren Gerlach will be here to teach my class at 11 o'clock on Sunday, next Sunday, and the next Sunday. So you don't want to miss that. She's always just, just such a wonderful job, um, really. And then Patty and I will be back for July 30th, and I will teach that day something. <laughs> I mean, we get back like Thursday night, so I don't know what we're going to do. But yeah, come. It'll be fun. Let's see what Scott come, cooks up in two days. So, because I'm not working on vacation, I'm telling you. I used to do a lot of that years ago here at St. Andrew. But no, we, I, I just, we're, it's our 25th anniversary summer. So, we're, yeah, yay. So, sure. So, I'm not, I'm not planning on, on doing like real work or work at all in any fashion. Um, so let's see, Patty, what do you have for us today, dear? Today was one of those days where there was very few national days of anything, huh. but it is National Dimples Day. Dimples. Dimples, and I think that only means in cheeks. <laughs> These cheeks. <laughs> and it's National Sugar Cookie Day. That's good. Yeah. <clears throat> That's good. Yes. I love those Pepperidge Farm sugar cookies. Yeah, she, oh, she does. Oh, my goodness. It's the truth. You know, I noticed for years they would just call sugar cookies. Now they put Zurich in front of it, and they're like $2 more. I am serious. I think they're trying to get us to believe that it's really some kind of international delight, but they still taste exactly the same, which is awesome. And you like them. It's awesome. So the only thing else I wanted to... Um, just say is that this past Thursday was our very first line dancing class and it was way fun really way way fun um, they ended up clearing the entire room of chairs instead of only half the room so we had lots of room to spread out the staff here took a class before us from the same teacher and that went really really well I came early to watch them and I was getting blown away thinking, oh my gosh, we're going to be awful. Look how good they are. We were awesome. I'm just saying, we really were. Uh, there was more than 40 people that signed up and came. A uh, few people could not come because of just different things, uh, getting maybe released on a medical release kind of thing. But no, seriously, seriously, I think there was a few people that wanted to use this kind of as a physical therapy thing. but. They weren't quite ready, you know, their doctor wanted them to wait a little bit. But I do have room in that class for about 10 more people. So if anybody wants to come, please just call Marlene, call the church office on um, Monday and ask for Marlene Aldridge. She is Kay Richardson's secretary, and she could take your information over the phone, and you could just pay when you came on Thursday. But it really was fun, I promise. And if you wear a Apple Watch, you will be shocked at how many steps you get. It's like awesome. Thank you, Patty. Anything else? That's it. Okay. <laughs> so there are red boxes, and if you could register your presence as they move to the back, one for each section, as well as the Joyous and Concerns notebooks. Keep those moving, and please write down any prayers you would like lifted up at the end of the class, and Patty will do that. Knowing that there are many prayers we carry in our hearts which we don't write down. You know, I, I, li I lifted it up just a few joys and concerns this morning that the church had, but there are countless prayers in our hearts, and we're comforted, you know, Romans 8, <laughs> by the promise that, you know, that God's Holy Spirit lifts up to God the prayers that we hardly even are aware of in our hearts. So, um, indeed, will you pray with me right now? Gracious Lord, we are grateful to be gathered here again, gathered to come and to, for this summer, um, to really turn ourselves over to Scripture for this time, to try to read Scripture well, to hear you well, um, to see the truth of the good news, the truth of who you are and who we are in this world we live in. And we just pray that you would fill us with wisdom and discernment today um, as we pray every time. All this we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. And the mission baskets will go around as well. And as you know, um, the missions collection is 
uh, a big fund that the missions committee does a spectacular job of administering and doing a lot of good with that so uh, don't hesitate to be generous it's one of those places where you can know that the money goes into the fund just goes 100 percent goes out to um, the ministries that the committee um, chooses to help okay so we are in i don't know maybe this is the fifth week um, of 10 bible passages um, that i wish christians knew well i just thought that the right follow-on over the length of the summer was coming out of all that we did in january through may was to spend time actually in scripture um, which is of course what i do every monday and tuesday that's what those classes are we have a book of the bible we go through it from the first verse to the last verse and read it, talk about it, the whole thing. But we don't do that so much in here, but we're doing it this summer. And um, today we're going to the New Testament. We're going to go to to John chapter 1. And we're going to go to John's prologue. So let me just do a little bit of ground clearing here around John. John's gospel is very much unlike Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called synoptic gospels, S-Y-N, optic, O-P-T-I-C, which means red side by side, and they are really um, fairly similar. There are portions of them that are shared um, word for word. Um, but John's gospel is very different. It's different in tone. It's different in the way he writes. It is the only what we call a miracle story that is shared with John and the synoptics. The other three is the feeding of the 5,000. So that's it. Otherwise, all the miracle stories in Matthew, Mark, and Luke do not appear in John, and John has other stories. I mean, at the end of the gospel, John says, look, I could fill a library with all the things that we did for those two and a half or three years of Jesus' public ministry. Instead, he writes this, this gospel, this, and understand what a gospel is. It isn't really, it's not a biography. It's not an ancient, they, in the ancient world, they were called lives, like lives of the 12 Caesars or something. It, they are proclamations of the good news told in this narrative um, and this storyline so that you can see what God is doing, was doing in this world, is doing still what he did in the incarnation with Jesus so that you can come to grasp why Jesus um, took on human flesh, what it meant for us, walk with him in his ministry, but they are proclamations of the good news, and John writes his last. It's the last of the four Gospels to be written, probably in the early 90s, which is about 60 years after Jesus' death and resurrection. Um, John, who was a very young, probably the youngest of the disciples, um, is, if we go with whom everybody thinks, most everybody thinks wrote the gospel. Um, he's a, so by now he's an old, he's an old man. Um, there's a story um, about a tradition about what happened to John after Jesus' resurrection. It is the, and it is that after spending some time in the, what we call the Holy Land, John and Mary ended up in Ephesus, and that is where they lived out their lives. And indeed, outside Ephesus, if you go up the mountainside, there's a small house there that is remembered as Mary's house. Um, and, but he wrote this, um, he wrote it so that we might believe, and that is, and he, uh, let's see, one other point, the, the thing that he takes on, the point that he has to make, I think, above all others, is the truth that Jesus is God. My own take on it is that by the 90s, as the, as the Jesus movement grows, it's growing in the face of a lot of skepticism. That, of course, that this, you're telling us that this Jewish tradesman from a small village in Galilee was God. And the Christians were saying, yes, he is God. 
And I think that colors every single part of John's gospel. And it is why he begins it with this prologue. Um, before you get to, the, go get to the action with John the Baptist and so forth, you have this prologue in which John lays this out. And he does it famously this way. These are the opening verses of John's gospel. In the beginning, and right away, what do we notice? In the beginning. How does the book of Genesis begin? In the beginning. No accident. In the beginning was the Word. Okay? The Word. It meant different things for the Greeks and for the Jews, but God's Word was spoken. We talked about this some in the sermons and I did in the background study when we did the Word for the Week on hearing in the ear. Um, hear that, that God's revelation for the Jews is given to the ear. It is spoken. And the ear becomes this organ of cognition. It's spoken. Um, and so the translators who render the Greek word logos as word get it right. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. Boom. Right there. Opening phrase. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, John is not... <sighs> I mean, he's not... He, he, I'll just say it. He's not an idiot, okay? <sighs> because it seems, on the surface, nonsense to say the Word was with God, and the Word was God. How can you be with someone and be that someone? Well... That's, they're right off the bat, you're taken into the mysteries of what the Christians would end up calling the Trinity. But this verse right here is a touchstone, of course it is. It's why you hear it coming from, certainly my mouth, so often. Is it the only place where the statement is made about Jesus' divinity? Of course not, we looked at that at some length early in the year. But it's just, it's so clear. It's like a trumpet just sounding across, across the room, across the city. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was God in the beginning. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. Now the pronouns here are referring to, as we learn later, to Jesus. So, if I take the pronouns out, it goes like this. Jesus was with God in the beginning. Through Jesus, all things were made. Without Jesus, nothing was made that has been made. That is Colossians chapter 1 by Paul. All things were made in, through, and for Jesus because they were made in, through, and for God. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him, in Jesus, was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. In John's Gospel, there's a bright line between the light and the darkness. In John's Gospel, from beginning to end, there's this bright line, light and darkness. There is no middle ground. There is no twilight. You are called out of the darkness into the light. Out of the dark, as Peter put it, out of the darkness into the light, as Peter says, so that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who created this world, who saved this world. You're called out of the darkness in the, into the light and... It's very clear in John's gospel that you are in the darkness until you're into the light. And there is, there is no light without Jesus because he is the light. He is the light in whom you must be. So, this prologue, it's just this stunning, stunning way to open the gospel. And it's beloved and it's important and here's the thing, it's true. 
When John writes, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, what is the ground stone, the gr what, what's the basis for him to make such a profound statement? What's the evidence that something like this could possibly be true? The resurrection of Jesus. If I ever ask you what the evidence is for Christianity, and this lies right at the heart of the Christian proclamation, the evidence is begins with the resurrection. It's not the only evidence, but it is the it's the linchpin. You know that jo you know linchpin jo joins a horse and a wagon. Um, so I'm told. <laughs> I don't want you to think I know much about horses and wagons, but yeah, right. So it is the it is, it is the resurrection is the linchpin. Arthur read a passage from Scripture this morning, right? These disciples believed and they gave their lives for the truth that John expresses in the beginning of his gospel. All right? The Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was was God. All things made through Jesus, all things made in Jesus, all things made for Jesus. He is the light that overcomes the darkness. It set the stage for everything that comes. And then John goes on. Oops. Well, I scooped way ahead, didn't I? There we go. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him all might believe, have faith, trust the truth of this good news about Jesus. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. John the Baptist himself was not the light. He came only to witness to the light. Because the light is whom? Jesus. Later in the gospel, Jesus will say, I am the light of the world. He charges us with being the light, but it's a derivative light. Derived, we, the light we have to share with the world is derived from whom? From Jesus. John goes on, the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. And so we are into the what? The incarnation, which will be spelled out clearer in a few verses. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him, as in rejected by his own people, the Jews. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed, who faithed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. This is why I say, and I keep reminding people, that when you come to Scripture, you need to learn to read it well. And one of the ways, don't, don't listen, you don't... The world doesn't understand what it needs to know about reading Scripture. The phrase, the children of God, in Scripture means God's people. It does not mean humanity writ large. Humanity writ large is all, we're all created in the image of God. But children of God is a special phrase of those who are God's people who have been born of God, not by natural descent, human decision, or a husband's will. Maybe the wife's will, I don't know. <laughs> but born of God. Now we come famously to verse 14. The Word became flesh. And here's the incarnation presented plainly and clearly. The Word who was in the beginning and was with God and was God became flesh. That's you. That's me. That's human. We talked about this a couple of months ago, about the truth that God is both divine and human. God and human. And that the early church spent centuries talking about and working through all the mistakes that we can make when we come to that, dividing Jesus into parts. 
or making him some kind of weird third alien third species or something. No, it's a simple proclamation. He is God and he is human. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Now that's actually a big word, that dwelling word there. Because when God takes the Israelites across the Red Sea, down to Mount Sinai at the Exodus, right? You've seen the movie. And I always do that, I know. So you've seen the movie. So it takes them to Mount Sinai where he will give them his law and these blueprints for the tabernacle. God says he will dwell with his people. That's, that's, that's the connection here. Jesus is God dwelling among his people. As God had dwelt with his people before. But now God has taken on human flesh in the person of Jesus, who has always been, is, and always shall be. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. I don't like it when the translation changes it simply to lived among us, because you miss that connection. Made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Verse 15, John testified concerning him. John cried out, saying, This is the one I spoke about when I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. What? What? Really? <laughs> I loved it today in the sermon when I was just reading along and he, and he gets to the stop and says, you know, you're just not going to be, Father's not going to forgive you unless you forgive others. And he says, uh-oh. Yeah, really. You know, you need to read. That, that's why you can't just read your favorite part. You got to read all of it. You got to read all of the verses. You got to take your time and you got to read carefully. He who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Jesus was before anything in the beginning. He was with God and indeed was God. Is, has there ever been a time when Jesus did not exist? Ah, good answer. <laughs> right, we talked about that a few months ago. That's, that, that's, the, that's the Arian heresy, that there was a time when the Son did not exist. And they lost in the theological, doctrinal struct, um, work in the, of, of those first centuries, which I will say, Reverend Lauren Gerlach loves to talk about. So if you have questions about all that, she is your go-to person. So, John, the writer, goes on. Out of his fullness, we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. To, uh, Paul would echo this. It isn't that the law given by God was a bad thing. The law, God gave that law. How could it be a bad thing? It was a good thing. But it outlived its usefulness. It, its time had passed now when Jesus come. It was, um, John, uh, Paul. Paul refers to this as like having a nanny. Nannies are important when you're little, little kids. But when you go to be a full adult, you don't need the nanny anymore. That's how, that's how Paul, it's a one way Paul talked about the, the fact that things changed with Jesus. But it doesn't mean the law was bad. It's just that it's time had passed. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son who is himself God and is in closest relationship with Father has made him known. Jesus will echo himself, will echo this himself when he says, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. And of course the disciples' heads are spinning around because the Father was a way, don't think the Trinity, Father was a way that Jews in Jesus' day referred to God. So um, the, the Trinitarian stuff will come, okay? But for the Jews of Jesus' day, it, it's a, and so when Jesus says, you know, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, well, 
I imagine those are the kind of words that, you know, they would kind of let go in kind of one ear and out the other because, you know, on the, they, they don't understand. I have a lot of sympathy for the disciples, by and large. How could they understand? We sit here 2,000 years later, and my advice to you is not to domesticate chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Don't just say to yourself, oh, well, 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 sure. Let yourself be blown away by it. And then you marry it with verse 14, and, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and you're going, oh. And if it isn't, if it isn't expanding your understanding, you're going at it the wrong way. We have a tendency to want to make God too small. We want to figure everything out, and we want to put God in a box that we can put four lines around and understand, yeah, okay, that makes full sense to me. It must be good. No. you got to be... I mean, the universe is expanding all the time, right? So the scientists tell us, sounds good to me. Why don't we understand that our, when we come to God, our understanding of God has to be constantly expanding because of the infinite glory of God in our, our own finiteness, right? We have brains, yes, but they're, they're limited, they're limited. So, now, that's the prologue. Um, and then we turn to the narrative of John down by the Jordan River calling people to come and so forth. And there's one of my favorite verses, one of the most important verses, I think, that we are coming up to right there that will lead into the second section for today. They're questioning John, are you the one? Are you the Messiah? Are you the prophet? He's going, no, 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 no. He says, and he, <clears throat> he says, I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness. That guy up there, standing up there. Make straight the way for the Lord. Okay? The next day, this is verse 29, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and he said, look, and I like the old word here, behold. Look is so... Right? I mean, sometimes you just want the language to be a little bit elevated. Just a bit. Behold. The, and he's pointing, he's pointing at this guy walking up the riverbank. Okay, so let me just set the stage. So, so John, John the baptizer is there, and there's people all around him, and he's on the riverbank, and he sees this guy come, and he says, Behold! And I imagine he pauses as everybody swivels their heads. Behold, because I think he points to, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Wow could be the same after John says something like that. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So we're going to talk about the Lamb of God in just a minute because this, this image of the Lamb of God is an image woven throughout Scripture. Old Testament, New Testament, here, there, all over the place. The Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And I want to point out to you that it's not plural. Sins can be thought of as transgressions. Um, things that we do, what are they? They are the myriad ways in which we fail to love God and to love neighbor. And there's... I don't, I don't think, I think we want to try to avoid rank ordering them. Problem with that, if you rank order sins, you're going to end up assuming that everybody's sins are worse than your own. That's the, that's the pastoral point here. But they have different effects, right? But those are sins. You could, you could, you could I think, write some down on a piece of paper. This is, <clears throat> I'm getting too excited. This is sin, Singular. It's singular in the Greek. 
Singular, what does that mean? It takes away the sin of the world. It refers to the fact that the world is in this terrible, terrible, terrible problem. That there is a darkness, to go to John's Gospel again, there is a darkness in this world. And where does that darkness lie? Not in the cycles of the day, of the evening and the day, and the sun and the stars, and the, not in that. That darkness lies in the human heart. There's a famous novel by somebody, Conrad, called The Heart of Darkness. The darkness lies in our own heart, and it, it is born out of humanity, writ large, rebellion against God. So here we have the Lamb of God who has come to take away the sin of the world. So of course the prologue says that this, this man whom, G, whom John the Baptist is pointing to is the light that overcomes the darkness. Jesus is that light. There is no other light like Jesus. And that light, Jesus, takes away the sin of the world. And there is no other way to do that. So, before we go on and talk about the Lamb of God, well, that's just showing you, that's, I should have used this map, that's where John the Baptist was doing John the Baptist thing, probably. So, any questions, take a question or two right here before we go on to the Lamb of God. Yes, I see a hand with great fervor going up there, Beth. Yes. Yes. A phrase that we use to talk about this singular sin that captivates humanity is original sin because the simple, commonplace observation across humanity is that it, it's present in everyone's heart from generation to generation, going back in time as long as you can look. So it is the original sin that comes out of the garden. Because what is the garden story about in Genesis 3? Don't get lost in the details of Genesis 3 until you know what Genesis 3 is about. Genesis 3 is about humanity's rebellion against God. There's one thing God tells them not to do, and by gosh, they're going to do that one thing. And when they do that one thing, that is the, their rebellion against God. And the rest of it is all about the consequences of that. They're shaming, they're shamed, they're blaming each other. They're, the, the murder of Cain and Abel and the growth, the flourishing of evil across the world, that all stems from this human rebellion against God. And we make a tragic mistake if we think that that Genesis 3 story is only about them, whatever you think them are, and not us. It is our story. We are Genesis 3 people. I never used that phrase before. That's not a bad phrase. We are Genesis 3 people. In that, we rebel against God. Do we really love God and love each other every day and in every way? I don't think so. I love you guys, but we don't. You have to be honest about this. Christians look at the world. We don't, we don't use rose-colored glasses. A tragic mistake right now in modern cultural society in America is that people have rose-colored glasses on. They don't understand humanity. And they're constantly, I used a word the other day. This is another old man word. <laughs> so prepare yourselves. They're constantly gobsmacked. <laughs> they're constantly gobsmacked by when they discover, oh gosh, you mean, you mean people might really do? I can't really trust everybody. I probably can't trust anybody fully. You mean that's really how we are? Yes, that's really how we are. Let me talk to you about what the problem is. And I would talk with them about sin. And I would talk, about them, talk with them about the solution to that problem. And that solution is only found in Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. 
you know, it's, it's, it's not just a story. It's, it's not just a story that we're supposed to tell amongst ourselves. You see, here's, here's the pickle for Christians. It's, real, it's all well and good for the world to say to Christians, well, that's really nice. I'm glad you believe what you do, and I'm going to leave you. You can just go believe all that amongst yourselves, and that's really cool. We have a public proclamation. Jesus told us to deliver it publicly because it's for the sake of the world. It isn't something we can just sort of sit on and enjoy amongst ourselves. It is a public proclamation, not a private one. And thus, just telling us to keep it to ourselves is a non-starter. Has to be. Has to be. Okay, so let's talk about the Lamb of God. And I found what is one of the most famous paintings of the Lamb of God. This was painted by a Spanish artist named... I'm going to butcher his, the pronunciation, so forgive me. Um, Zubaran, several hundred years ago. I believe that Patty and I saw the original once. I'm not sure about that, but it, we saw it in a museum. So, but it might have been, he might have done more than one of these. But this is his painting, and he um, titled it Agnus Dei, the Lamb of God. Agnus Dei, the Lamb of God. Very, very powerful. You know, I know when I saw this painting, you just couldn't help but be moved by it. When you realize what this painting is really all about. And that story begins where? You probably know. That story really begins in plain sight in the book of Exodus. When they are have... Get, they're getting ready to, God is preparing them to avoid, to be spared the death of the firstborn. And so Yahweh says to Moses and Aaron something that they are to pass on to the Hebrews in anticipation of what God is about to do, in anticipation of their exodus from Egypt. And when this death of the firstborn will pass them over tell the whole community of israel that on the tenth day of this month each man is to take a lamb for his family one for each household if any household is too small for a whole lamb they must share one with their nearest neighbor having taken into account the number of people there are you are to determine the amount of lamb needed in accordance with what each person will eat the animals must be Year-old males without defect, and they can either be sheep or they can be goats. Take care of them. And when all the members of the community, all the members of the community must slaughter them at twilight on the 14th day of the month, they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lamb. That same night, they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire, along with bitter herbs, because this is a bitter experience. And bread made without yeast. So it's sort of a pita-type bread that you don't have to wait to rise, because there's no waiting. They're going to have to go, go, go. Do not eat the meat raw or boiled in water, but roast it over a fire with the head, the legs, and the internal organs, and then they are to eat it. And they're to eat it with their cloak tucked into their belt, ready to go. Your, your sandals on your feet, got those sneaks on, ready to go. And your staff in your hand, eat it in haste. Eat it in haste, there's no waiting. Eat it in haste. This is Yahweh's Passover. And this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Indeed, the Lamb, the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God. And then you come to Revelation, all the way at the far end of Scripture. In chapter 5, 4 and 5 in Revelation, you, John is given this vision of the throne room, throne room of God, around which there, in which there are elders and angels and so forth. And the one who sits on the throne is surrounded by those who are weeping, 
because the elder, the one on the throne holds a scroll sealed with seven seals, which needs to be opened, but it seems that there is no one worthy to open this scroll. Then, chapter 5, verse 6. Then I saw a lamb, looking as if it had been slain, just standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. The lamb had seven horns, all powerful, seven eyes, all seeing. All of these images in Revelation are meant to convey their, their symbols and the rest of it, okay? That's, that's what Revelation is filled with. The lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He went, the lamb went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the four twenty-four elders fell down before the lamb. And they sang to the lamb. Who is this lamb? It's Jesus, you see? You, when you come to Revelation, you ruin the poetry in it. If you start wondering, well, how could a lamb grab hold of a scroll? and open it. That doesn't make sense. Of course it doesn't make sense. It's not what is happening here. This is an image of this lamb as, that looks as if it had been slain. This is from a, not a triptych, but a, I think they call it like a polytick or something. It has all these panels written by the Van, um, painted by the Van Eck brothers hundreds of years ago. But this is a famous one. This is obviously a rendition or a painting from their imaginations of the Lamb of God on this throne. When you walk into the sanctuary and you look at the rose window, what is at the center of the rose window? See, that's the victorious Lamb. Because if I were to read on in Revelation, we would come to the victorious Lamb. of Revelation 19, the conquering Lamb. You see? And so sometimes you'll see in rose windows and things a Lamb that is like lying down or looks more like looks more like this but the lamb in our rose window is the victorious lamb all of it is encompassed in this why because all of it is encompassed in in Jesus here the prophet Isaiah Which we read, which I read some from last week. I just want to remind you of a piece. I think it was last week. This, this, it's Jesus' it's Jesus in Isaiah 53. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was like a he was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. For he bore the sin of man, Isaiah writes down sometime later. It's just, see, there's another victorious lamb. So the lamb of God, the most... One of the most, uh, I, like, I, like the, I like the narrative. So for me, this image of John the baptizer down at the river, seeing Jesus coming and saying, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world always makes the hair stand up on the back of my neck and on my arms. It's just so powerful. And then when you remember that the Lamb of God is this sacrificial lamb from the Exodus whose blood is spread across the doorway? Why is it that, that Jesus says on the night of his, night before his crucifixion with the disciples, this is my body. It is broken for you. This is my blood. It is shed for you. Because Jesus is going to be that sacrificial lamb. In Exodus 12, in that ritual, it is the blood of the lamb that is spilled. The, 
bones of the lamb that are broken so that the death of the firstborn, so that the plague passes them over. And Jesus will take that, turn it, focus it not on the little lamb or goat, but on himself. He will be the lamb. It will be his blood that is shed. It will be his body that is broken. Why? So that we, so that in the largest sense, so that death passes us over. Now you may say to me, well, Scott, but people die. Of course people die. But here's the great truth. Death does not hold us. Death does not hold us. Death is not the end of our story. Why? Because of what Jesus has done for you and for me, for everyone, if they will just avail themselves of Jesus and his faithfulness and his devotion to God and his willingness, his obedience to God to take on human flesh, which we'll talk about next, ah, not next week, Scott, on July 30th, because on July 30th, I'm going to talk about Philippians chapter 2, mainly a little bit of chapter 1, but Philippians 2, another absolute center of all of this, this. This is the truth about how things are. They're not just nice things to say about Jesus. There's the truth of how things are, that Jesus came, came to save, because we are incapable of saving ourselves, incapable of it. It's been demonstrated over, over these many, many millennia. I love the quote from G.K. Chesterton, who was a, a Christian apologist and all-around smart dude um, back at the beginning of the 20th century. He said, look, of all the Christian doctrines, I'm going to paraphrase, of all the Christian doctrines there are, and there are a bunch, there's only one that has been empirically proven. Empirically. And that is original sin. Because all you have to do is open your eyes and look around and you can see the truth of it. That there is a darkness in the human heart and you are a fool if you deny it. So, anyway. Okay. So, some questions. Yes. Yes. Um, ah, okay, let's see. Let me get back to that slide. Okay, I would say not. Because this is the, be, because this is the company of heaven. But I haven't talked to the Van Eck brothers about this, so I don't. I don't know. I mean, it's a good catch, but I'm just guessing that it, that is not. They, they're all dressed in all this various garb. But, you know, if, if it is Satan, what do you know about Satan from the book of Revelation? That he's a great big loser, right? Oh, I'm sorry. The question is, do you see the person in black here in the corner lower as you're sitting there, lower left-hand corner, the one person who's wearing, I'm not sure he's the only person wearing black, but he's wearing black. So is that Satan? And I'm saying, I don't know. There's a lot of different garb that um, clerics and stuff wore at the time, which obviously let me these folks are dressed in. So I don't know. That's a good question, though, but I'm betting not. But if it is, he, he should, he should, on his face, he should look more like a loser. <laughs> I don't know, Evie. Lauren, do you have any thoughts about that? Know anything about it? Yeah, see, Lauren and I are together. Yes. You know what, though? If the Van Eck brothers ever told anybody about this, we'll find, you can find it on the Internet. Okay. <laughs> that's the truth. You know, that's where I go all the time looking for things. Okay, other questions? Maybe one I could even attempt to answer. Anything? I don't, I, I can't see hands very well today because the lights are bright. Okay, we cool?
All right. I'm going to turn it over to Patty then. A little bit early, Patty. You got, you got time. Here, I'll even put up. I'll remember to do this. I never remember to put that slide up. Scott, I need just a second to read this over. I'm sorry. Okay. Talk about... All right. Talk amongst yourselves. So Patty yourselves. needs a second sorry. to read this over. Sorry, there's some long So, fears. somebody give me a question. <laughs> it could be about any old thing. The meeting tonight... The meeting tonight is for those who are going on the Israel trip. It'll be at 5 o'clock um, right here. Um, and representatives will be here from Marta and Celebrity. And I hope you can come. We will hopefully be able to stream it and record it. That's all in the plan. I hope it works. Okay, anything? Okay, over there. What's the question? Yes, well, Paul has one. <clears throat> Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, that he, Jesus appeared to more than 500 during that period, right? Because what he does is he goes through, well, he appeared to bum, 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 the disciples, bum, 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 and last um, to me, and he appeared to more than 500. And as if to say, really saying, that, you know, 500, some of those people are still alive. That's, and he's writing this only maybe maybe 22 years after, after the resurrection, that you could go and ask them, right? So that's a very early piece of testimony, this, this creedal beginning to 1 Corinthians 15. Very creedal, very early. Probably comes from, you know, most of the scholar, New Testament scholars that I respect the most would say probably from within a year after the resurrection, this, this creedal beginning to 1 Corinthians 15, um, is, that's where it originates. And it is this testimony about, about the evidence for the truth of this. Because you see, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, if it's not true, then we've all believed a lie. And we're to be pitied more than any. We could find something else to do on Sunday morning if it didn't happen. If Jesus wasn't resurrected, this is all just a waste. But it was, Paul says. He was resurrected and begins to present the evidence for that. The most valuable evidence in the ancient world, which is eyewitness testimony to the truth of it. Thank you. I'm sorry. Just Are you good, Patty? I am. I, I am. know. Thank I finished. You. I looked on my clock, and it's not like me to finish a little okay. bit early. But so I, I have a number. Normally, of, I just go on and on and on. <laughs> I have a number of prayers today from folks who were watching online, and some of them actually were re praying for on on uh, the sheets I got today. But a very big joy for a young couple that go to this class all the time, Matthew and Candace. Kolodowski, they had a brand new baby on new July baby. 3rd. Yes. So that's, that's just really awesome. And um, Candace and Matthew are both doing well, as is little baby Alexander David. So please Aww. keep them in, in your prayers. It's uh, such a joy that we have such young couples now that are, you know, we do. Uh, for a while we didn't, but we have a lot more younger people that are coming to this class, and so I'm so grateful for that. Uh, there's a prayer here to please continue praying for Kathy Sutherland's sister, Laura. She is in the hospital battling sepsis. Uh, she's got dangerously low potassium and high sodium, so please let's keep Laura in our prayers. Um, a prayer from Sandra Shaw. Um, she is praying for Michaela Wiley. I can't, sorry, her last name is, I'm not able to say. Her mom is hospitalized with a lung mass thought to be stage four lung cancer. Wow. Um, and for family members hospitalized, Elsa Lynn uh, for back surgery and her husband fell and had a hip replacement. S sorry, that was a, 
a little hard for me to read that one. I hope I got everybody's names correctly. Continued prayers for Chuck and Judy Williams for strength and, current and uh, comfort during Chuck's recovery. Um, Brad and Marcia Miller will celebrate their 59th anniversary on Tuesday. Whoa. Congratulations, that's awesome. Um, Mike Kelly is asking prayers for a former St. Andrew member who has a serious health issue, including a heart condition and narrowing of the spine. And prayers for Mike for a, a biopsy that he is waiting on, that that biopsy is gonna come back clear. Prayers for healing for a brother, Byron, who was just diagnosed with throat cancer, and that is from Robin Pratt. Um, prayers for a friend of Dawn's uh, named Rick, who passed away this week from leukemia. We have a joy that Carol Stewart is back with us today because she is going to the Israel meeting tonight. We're glad to have Carol back. And a joy that Linda McLaughlin's cancer um, basically is not there right now from what I understand. She is having to take a brand new medicine um, and she will have to continue with that indefinitely. Um, it's an experimental drug um, and she'll take that until her body resists it. But the great news for now is she has to be, she's feeling good, but she has to be very careful in large groups with hugs and things like that. So we understand we continue to, I know Scott and I, we pray for her every day that hopefully there'll be a point where she's able to come back. And many of you remember her as our lovely coffee lady in the back for years, for many, many years. And prayers for a dear friend who has fallen um, twice in one week from her neuropathy. And those prayers came from Carol Wilson. Um, I have a prayer here that um, I'm not gonna identify anybody, but it is a prayer that, um, that maybe in the beginning when we're all talking to people in the back and most of us just go over and talk to our own friends, that there are some people in our class who would love to be involved in friendships with some other folks in the class, but they don't feel like that they're being acknowledged and so I know it's difficult for all of us to do that it's even hard for me to walk up to somebody I don't know and just say hey I'm glad you're here but um, there is there is a number of people that do feel like that they are not really uh, part of our group and of course none of us want anyone to feel that way um, we do try to have social events in this class and I can recommend that to anybody who does not find the time to talk to people in class, when we have them, they are so much fun. We all share a great meal. People are walking around, introducing themselves. Anyway, that, that is a prayer request for today, and I wanted to make sure that um, I made that known. Um, prayers today from Chuck Bilkey for his wife, Shirley, who is recovering from her back surgery. Prayers from Celeste for a good friend of hers named Joe. Uh, Joe has pancreatic cancer, and today is Joe's birthday, so let's, let's pray for her. Um, I know of at least two other couples that are waiting for test results right now um, for at least one of the, one of the, the married partners, and um, many of us know that sometimes waiting is the hardest, hardest part, so let's just pray for peace that, uh, you know, God's peace that passes all understanding as they wait for those results. Um, prayers for um, a good outcome of an MRI and a nuclear scan that Sharon Kerr will receive later this month. And there was a prayer from Nancy Pratt for Scott and I to have a safe trip and for us to come back. <laughs> <laughs> so grateful for that. <laughs> so um, thank you. I know that was a lot of prayers and I'm, thank you for your time. I just had to read some of that before I started saying it out loud. So thank you. Let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you today. We thank you, God, for this class that has met so many years, Lord, and just help us, God. We, we all know so many people in this group. Help us to try to be a little bit more outgoing, maybe, and, and meet some new folks as we see people enter our class. Um, we pray, God, that you would keep this group nice and close, keep us close to you, God. We know, God, that whenever we don't feel your presence, it is us that has stepped away from you.
We pray, God, for Lauren over the next two weeks to just bring her magic as she teaches this class for Scott. We pray, God, that you would keep each of us healthy, God. We pray for your safety, and we pray, God, for your wisdom and your discernment in our lives. Help us, God, each day to make good choices and good decisions. Bring us all back safely, Lord, in a few weeks. We lift up all these prayers today, so many joys, so many concerns. In the holy name of your son, Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Okay, adios, everybody.